<clears throat> All right, here we go in chapter seven. Finally, something useful, huh? Persuasion. Uh huh. Finally, we can actually use this stuff. The persuasion is interesting, and in fact, um, one of the like we had said earlier, um, at the end of the end of our book, we're going to have a couple of chapters on um, applying social psychology to different areas, and I believe there's going to be like the social psychology and the clinic, social psychology and the legal or something. But I can envision that they could write. Um, social psychology and advertising or social psychology in the media or something like that because that's really what this chapter is about this is i mean it's written as a, you know as a basic science or something rather than an applied thing but it doesn't take a huge stretch of an imagination to apply this stuff um and in fact in the fourth paper i'm going to ask you to apply this stuff in um how to become a cult leader how not 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 that i recommend it but how to do so so keep your eyes open for that video too all right, so here in persuasion, we're going to talk about, you know, what are the paths to persuasion and um, how can we persuade people or what makes somebody more persuasive or or who is persuasible. I don't know if that's even a word, but look that one up in your dictionary. And we're going to talk about different, different elements of persuasion. By definition, persuasion is a process by which a message induces change in beliefs, attitudes, or behaviors. By the way, I'm going to tell you right up front, this is a... Uh, an interesting fact. Um, I, I know I've I've told you um, I'm I'm a behaviorist. Look at my pedigree. I am Mr. Behavior. Well, here's where the persuasion uh, here in this chapter where this becomes particularly relevant because when it comes to persuasion, um, let's say for example, I I'm not let uh, let's say I'm not trying to persuade you to prefer a candidate, a political candidate, or I'm not trying to persuade you to enjoy um, a product. No, I'm trying to persuade you to vote for a candidate or buy a product, okay? Honestly, if I am a candidate, I don't give a shit if you support me if you don't vote for me. And if I am selling a product, I don't care if you prefer my product if you don't physically buy my product. See, that's what it all comes down to. The goal of persuasion is not to change somebody's attitudes, although obviously changes in attitudes lead to changes in behaviors to the degree to which it attitude change leads to behavioral change I'll will I'll deal with attitude change but ultimately I don't really give a crap why you change your attitude the goal of persuasion is to change your behavior period okay if a message is good we call we, we call the persuasive message advert uh, education and if it's really bad we tend to call it propaganda okay now one person's education is another person's propaganda um, clearly, um, in communist Russia, for example, they have re-education programs. They don't have propaganda programs. Okay, so clearly, it depends on who who's asking the question. Um, here, in the last decade, America's support for gay rights and gay civil unions has significantly increased. And some people say it reflects an education into the issue, and some say no, it's propaganda. Damn, that's brainwashing. They're going to tell you. Persuasive messages, in order to work, must pass multiple math, uh, multiple multiple choice points or something here. What order? Multiple hurdles here. Um, we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of describe this this picture on this uh, on this page here. This is a, a beautiful picture, and then we'll um, kind of in many ways much of this much of this chapter is in so many ways an expansion of this little image here. Okay, so in order for somebody to be persuaded, okay. And the first thing you have to do is make them pay attention to a message, okay? And later on, we'll talk about that. Pay attention. What does that mean, okay? Paying attention means, um, um, like, uh, playing a little jingle that people, you know, hear and say, oh, I like that song. That's something cool. Or they might use a celebrity spokesperson, you know? So as soon as Michael Jordan gets on the television, bang, your eyes on it because there's something already there for Michael Jordan. We'll talk about some of that stuff. There's a variety of ways. But the first thing you got to do is get people to pay attention to the message. Now, the last time I taught this course, I came up with a little phrase, and it was, it was funny as heck, and I'm going to have to use it again. Even though it won't be nearly as funny now because it's not spontaneous, right? Now that it's not spontaneous, that time it was. But at this point, I had said apparently, one of my former students wrote it all down. Apparently, what I said was, it's amazing what a boob will sell, all right? And there's a point to that, right? I mean, if, you want, if you're trying to sell a product to, to um, men, 
will whip out a little cleavage out there and boys are going to be paying attention. Okay, but you got to get further into this for persuasion to occur. Not only do, do you have to pay attention, but I mean, again, if the answer is no, don't pay attention, then uh, everything else is irrelevant. The entire message is garbage. Okay, well, not only do people have to pay attention to it, but they have to comprehend it. Okay, and again, you have to know your audience. So we're going to talk about some of this stuff. Different audiences comprehend different things. I mean, if you are trying to use SAT words to sell um, kitty cereal, you're going to fail, right? Because the kids don't comprehend your message or something, okay? And again, if people don't comprehend their message, persuasion is never going to work, okay? Not only do they have to comprehend your message, but they have to believe your message, okay? And again, we're going to talk about the credibility factor and um, things such as the... Um, oh, uh, if you're trying to sell medicine on TV, they might perhaps put a guy in a, in a white lab coat and, uh, and then underneath it, not a real doctor, <laughs> really small letters. Yeah, you know, but the white lab coat helps you to believe it. Will you remember it? Maybe. That's why sometimes they'll use a uh, catchy little jingle. Um, I st oh, I remember one. There was uh, in, in New York. It was very cute. It was 1-800-M-A-T-T-R-E-S. Uh, leave off the last S for savings. Yeah, they had 1-800-MATTRESS. Leave off the last S for savings. And I still remember that message, right? I remember it because they had a catchy little jingle to go with it. Okay? Now, all of this is wonderful and everything, but will you behave accordingly? And if the answer is no, I mean, perhaps for uh, a variety of reasons, such as, um, I, I, I mean, I paid attention to your message, I understood your message, I believe your message, I remember your message, but my religious background taught me that I never do such a behavior. So maybe there still wouldn't be any action because of other outside factors. But notice, as I said, the goal of persuasion is ultimately, at the very end, action, or more specifically, behavior. Changes in behavior is the point of persuasion. And so now, the rest of this, um, the the rest of this slideshow is really very much an elaboration on on this idea right here. Effectiveness can be enhanced at any point, perhaps by increasing the attractiveness of, me of the messenger. Thus, increasing attention. We'll we'll talk about how effectiveness could be enhanced at various points along here. All right. There's two different uh, ways that we run down this path to persuasion. One well, one was called the central route of persuasion. And one is called the peripheral route of persuasion. Uh, the central route of persuasion occurs uh, when people are interested, uh, when they when they really focus on what's being said, when they internalize it. The peripheral route of persuasion is a lot more, um, dare I say, emotional. Well, you know, central route is more logical, the peripheral route is more emotional. And the peripheral route is, occurs when people are influenced by incidental cues, like how attractive the speaker is and stuff like that. Um, and it, as a fact, I mean, wh when you look at political candidates and, and you rate them on attractiveness, the, the more attractive candidate almost always wins. So peripheral route of persuasion, is there's something clearly to it. But um, the thing is, is, is uh, you can't put logical thought into every issue, okay? I mean, if an audience cares deeply about it, that's the thing. you got to know about your audience. If an audience just doesn't care that much and you're trying to... Um, to, to, to beat them down with facts, they just don't care. They're going to tune you out, okay? But if your audience is deeply interested and you're trying to just sell them with a pretty smile, it isn't going to work, okay? So you got to know your audience in order to know which direction to go with it. And so here is a couple... Oh, no, here. Nah. Nah. Whatever. Nah, read it if you want. Now again, here's a bunch of words, but, I mean, it's just expanding what I just said. Here's some examples. On the top left, we have Beowulf clusters. And you see this advertisement on the top left that clearly is following the central route of persuasion. Clearly. I mean, um, you're talking about a major purchase. These are probably or not. This is the, I, I don't even know what the hell a Beowulf cluster is. But clearly it's not something that I'm going to be purchasing for my home, okay? This is going to be some, some uh, super nerdy IT guy going to be uh, that knows what this is. And so... They're going to give all of the specs and the details because I, I, I'm assuming a Beowulf cluster is a fairly large purchase, not one that you make on a very regular basis. And so this they, they, they want to 
use the uh, central route of persuasion and, and make it a logical decision because the audience involved, that's what sells them. Okay, I can't imagine, let's say the uh, image on the right is to sell, what was it, Dove Body Wash, if memory serves, I can't see it here. I think it's to sell Dove Body Wash, and that's fine, because I mean, here's the deal, alright, it goes like this, um, what, what is the potential cost of buying the wrong bail, you know, the wrong cluster? I guess it'd be pretty deadly, huh? I don't know. What's the potential cost of buying the bo the wrong body wash? I get a little I get a little skin itch or some nonsense like that, right? I mean, come on, that they're, they're, these two products are not in the same ballpark, and therefore the uh, this the the advertisers know that they're using a different type of persuasion to sell a different product. Didn't I say it's amazing what a boob will sell? It'll sell body wash, apparently. I don't know if a boob would sell a Beowulf cluster, though. <laughs> Although I have seen, the, don't they have, I don't go to these things, but don't they have have the um, busty women at car shows to model off the car? So maybe it does. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the Beowulf company needs to rethink their strategy. I don't know. And then we got that one down there for Angelo's Restaurant. And um, if you can see it, it says, we serve children. And... I'm not sure if this is a central route or the peripheral route. Maybe this is a completely different route, which sort of just relies on the um, remembering factor and the grabbing your attention factor. I don't know, okay? I don't think I would want to go to that restaurant because that kid looks like he's still wearing diapers, which makes me wonder what's in their pasta. All right, so now, what would make a message more persuasive? The credibility, the believability. A credible communicator is perceived as both expert and trustworthy, okay? And we're going to come back to this later when we talk about social psych and the law, but here I go. Um, let's say, for example, I was brought up on to, um, to be a witness in a criminal case, okay? Now, the fact that I'm a PhD is absolutely and utterly irrelevant to my ability, whether or not I'm a good or a bad witness. But I guarantee you that um, were I to be brought up on that, the very first thing that the lawyer would say was, well, Dr. Brown, what do you think? And I'd be like, okay, doctor has absolutely nothing to do with my ability to witness, but to raise my credibility by throwing the title in front of it would raise my perceived expertise, trustworthiness, would raise my ability to persuade the jury, right? To persuade the judge and jury, okay? Um, a sleeper effect, blah, 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 okay. Attractiveness, um, an appealing communicator is someone, uh, persuasive. Obviously, um, the more physically attractive something is, the more, um, I mean, it, this is just simple, um, classical conditioning, uh, secondary, second order classical conditioning, and that is, um, and there's something uh, about, um, uh, let me see, you, you take something that already has positive value. Let's say the old classic was um, uh, Michael Jordan and the, uh, the Nike Air Jordan shoes. Now, the truth is those Nike Air Jordan shoes, they're really, they're not really that great, okay? They're made in Malaysia. Some poor Malaysian kid gets paid a nickel or something, um, the, and, and the kid gets cancer from the smell of the rubber that they're putting. I mean, it's just bad. The shoe is just a cheap piece of shit, okay? Um, but you know what? They have convinced the world that these things are the greatest. And they've done so by pairing this shoe with Michael Jordan. Now, I don't know any more about Michael Jordan. These shoes have sort of taken on a life in their own. and I, I don't bother still. What do I know? But back when they first introduced these things, Michael Jordan was a god. In many ways, was a god. The, just the very sight of Michael Jordan would would bring on an era of excitement, an era of an era of, of a feeling of wow, you know, fantastic kind of a thing. And so Michael Jordan comes out, and you're like, oh wow, fantastic. And then they show you the shoe, and this 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 excitement just sort of moves over to the shoe. Okay, and Michael Jordan's touching the shoe. Oh my goodness, it just sort of moves over. The good feeling moves over to that shoe. Now, I don't know how well it worked on the other product that he was um, spokesmaning for, the uh, Hanes underwear, but <laughs> Ooh, I'm not sure I want to see Michael Jordan in his underwear. Um, it's likewise, uh, we are more persuaded by people that are members of our own group. And um, 
that, I mean, that's evolution 101. I mean, we, we prefer things that we are familiar with. Therefore, we prefer people that are similar to ourselves. We're going to come back to this later when we get to attractiveness in some other chapter. I don't know where. Uh, authority, liking, what is this stuff? Persuasion principle, scarcity, oh yeah, people prize what's scarce. Um, clearly, we're going to talk about this. In fact, at the very end of this uh, show, uh, at, at the end of this slideshow, there's uh, an article I pulled out of somewhere. It was called Zones of Seduction. And it was like how the supermarket convinces you to buy all of the crap you don't need. Why is it you walked in to buy a gallon of milk and walked out with a cart full of stuff? Why did that happen? We're going to talk about that later. Uh, consistency, make people make a public commitment, reciprocity, repay what they've received. Ah, uh, whatever. Okay. Uh, well-educated or analytical people are more uh, more likely to travel the central route of persuasion and, and respond to rational appeals. Um, thoughtful, involved audience, uh, central route, we said that. Um, uninterested audience are more likely to run the peripheral route, and they tend to be affected by how much they like the communicator. So we could talk about these uh, all of these principles of attractiveness and stuff. Um, this, these principles of attractiveness, as an example, are more relevant to uninterested audiences that tend to travel the peripheral route than those that are well-educated or analytical um, and, and traveling the other route. Uh, messages associated with good feelings are persuasive. I got to remember this one. This was cute. I believe they had people, they read it, um, I believe they read persuasive messages and how influential were these messages. And it was about, oh boy, they had one, two, three, whatever it is. There had four different sets of um, persuasive messages. And they had some people reading these messages while they were eating and some not. And if they were eating while reading the persuasive messages, at the end they were more persuaded by the message. I mean, that's just crazy, man. So eating is, puts you in a good mood. Okay. Well, what about fear? Okay, like we said, you can you can arouse good feelings. If you're feeling good, you can be more persuasive. But what about if you're feeling bad? Okay, um, there's a new push now for these kinds of ad campaigns. These, by the way, these images come from Canadian cigarettes, uh, cigarettes. But apparently, the American cigarettes companies are looking to do the same kind of a thing. Um, but. I don't know, persuasive campaign, smoking kills, here's the problem, how can I solve the problem? Um, when it comes to arousing fear and persuasion, um, fear works, fear works, but if you just have, um, if you're just trying to persuade somebody by eliciting fear, it won't work. You have to, to both elicit fear and then follow that up with, how can I alleviate that fear? Smoking kills. <laughs> Stopping smoking now is the best defense. Oh, thankfully, you've given me a solution, okay? So the, the most persuasive type of campaign using fear would evoke the fear and then give you a, a way to alleviate that fear. Uh, I can't even remember this one. I don't care. All right, here. How about this? What? How, how about the fact that we often get uh, bombarded with multiple messages? Let's say, for example, in a presidential campaign, you might have a um, debate. And so both speakers debate. Which one are you going to listen to? Which one is more important? Which one are you going to carry a wave with it? Okay. And as a general rule, um, we could talk about the primacy and the recency effect. And both of these are from cognitive psychology. Maybe you can remember these from how memory works. But it's a similar idea. If you have one message, a second message, and then time passes, the first message tends to be accepted. Why? Because it's the first one you hear. That's a primacy effect. Okay? The first one you hear is remembered better than the second one you hear because by the time, you know, the, when, you re, when you're hearing the first message, your mind is clear. You haven't had any other, you don't have any other distracting information. By the time you get to message two, you're you're still organizing message one in your brain while message two is coming at you and you're not exactly ready for it, okay? However, if you have message one and then have some time in between there and then have message two, then you're much more likely to remember message two. This would be the recency effect. In this case, the one that you heard the most, just recently heard, 
is the one that you're more likely to accept. Okay? That's yeah, just, I mean, if they were both just equally good arguments. Um, we find that we're, we're being bombarded on a daily basis with these advertisements. People trying to persuade us to buy crap we don't need. Um, crap that we don't really want, but, you know, they're, they're, they're creating a desire for them. And it's, it's actually, I mean, an amazing thing how the word uh, want and need have um, become interchangeable in, in most children's uh, vocabularies. But I, I guess I should save that little sermon for my um, child psych class. But uh, it's troublesome how the word want and need get, get kind of thrown around and interchanged with each other. But anyway, persuasive messages can come in, in different ways, whether face-to-face -face or uh, 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 written uh, written down or by, uh, on a video or an email or something. Um, and different messages uh, are... are Different messages are more persuasive using different channels of communication. Um, say here, uh, no, I don't think I remember this one. I don't think I care about this one. I think I was, this one, this is one I was hoping for, yeah. Take a look here. There was two different types of persuasive messages. One which was a very, very simple message and one which was very uh, complicated. And it turns out that if it's a simple message, the most persuasive way to present a simple message, the purple line across the top is is video. You just present it. You can put flashy images on it. If you use the audio, you can use a little jingle. If you write it down, I get you can put a little I don't know picture or something. Okay, but if it's a very difficult message, then the the most effective way to present that is in fact in a written form, so that people can stop and re rethink and really think about it and think about the sentences as they're reading them. And so clearly. If you have a different message, let's say, um, again, going on to the Beowulf clusters, if you're trying to sell Beowulf clusters, it doesn't really make sense to uh, try to sell a Beowulf cluster on the radio, okay? It just doesn't, even if you even if you determine that your audience is, in fact, listening to the radio, it is such a complicated thing that your audience needs to stop and really think about it and reread it and think back to it. And so an audio tape message is just not the most, not an effective way to present such a message. Uh, the audience that you're speaking to, there's a lot of factors in an audience, but um, one of the factors, major factors about that modify the persuasiveness of an audience is in fact age. Um, obviously, as a general rule, uh, older people are more uh, conservative and younger people are more um, liberal. As a general rule, I mean, it's definitely not a truthness. I mean, we could draw that graph. Remember the one I'm talking about? Here's this group. Here's this group. The averages. There's a truth that the young people are more liberal than the old people are more conservative. But yet there's all kinds of overlap and blah, 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 blah. Remember that whole shit, right? We've seen that picture and we'll think about that again later. Um, eh, whatever, some say, some say, whatever, let's go on, okay, uh, all right, the audience, what are they thinking, um, number one, if an audience is, uh, warned ahead of time, then they're much more likely to, um, be less susceptible if they're if they're warned ahead of time then they're less susceptible if you catch them by surprise they don't have a, 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 the ability to uh, counter argue or something distraction tends to are uh, disarm the, the counter arguing so if we're distracted we're more persuadable um, I remember one time I was uh, buying a car it was it was, it was uh, my my child was oh boy it was we were living in New York so my kid was uh, less than a year old and uh, we were about to buy a car and it was it was a big purchase and um, we agreed on a price and I don't know I think maybe it was fifteen thousand dollars so we agreed on a price with a salesperson right and then um, the salespersons and then we said we were gonna pay in cash all right I had student loan money I was gonna use cash and um, so then the uh, the sales guy says, oh, no, 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 here, here's the deal. I, um, what I'm going to do, and, and uh, it was c crazy because my kid was just a pain in the ass that day. And see, now, this is the point of this story, by the way. Not not that car salesmen are scumballs. That's what I'm going to come to at the end. But, no, that's not true. Car salesmen are awesome. This car salesman, however, 
did not do any favors to that particular image of car salesmen are oh, he, he fit the stereotype um but anyway what 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 what, what uh, he says uh, uh, my kid was he was I was distracted by my kid and he knew it and was trying to take advantage of me he says oh no here's the thing I the only way I can offer that fifteen thousand is if you pay ten thousand in cash and finance the other five now if you want to just pay off that five in the very first month that's up to you and then you won't pay any finance charges and you're at your fifteen all right. So he brings out the contract, and we're all squared away. He brings out the contract, and the contract is 10000 cash, and then I don't remember the numbers, but so much per month for so many months, okay? And I'm like thinking in my head, but my kid just would not stop. He was just screaming. I guess he must have been teething or something. He was just a shit, man. And I was so distracted, and this guy knew it. That little asshole knew it. And I'm just like, this just isn't right. What? I can't think. And so what I did was I, I said, okay, that's it. I am going to come back tomorrow. Okay. I went back to my home, got the kid out of my hair, and sat down and actually looked at the numbers and thought about those numbers. And it was just crazy. If I had paid it off, it was like, Either he wrote it so that I was financing nine thousand dollars instead of five, or he was writing it so that my interest rate was like seventy nine percent. I mean, it was just there was he didn't. And I bring him. I brought it. And here's the shit. Now here's the shit. I bring it back. I bring it back to the car company, and the, the car salesman wouldn't even look me in the eye. Wouldn't talk to me. Nothing. I go to the manager, and the manager's like, "What do you want? It's our job to make money." And I'm like, "Seriously?" Isn't it illegal to shake hands and say 15000 and walk back with... No, if you would have signed it, it would have been your fault. Now do I care? My job is to make money. My job is to get what I can get out of you. And I'm like, you know, there's a truth to that, but Jesus, at what cost? I mean, oh, whatever. The point behind that whole story, <clears throat> upsetting, upsetting, is that if you are distracted... You are much more persuasive and be careful. Salesmen know this. Saleswomen too sometimes. They know this stuff. They are going to take advantage of you. Don't let them. Be aware of it. Okay? Um, all right. Uh, la, la, la. Uninvolved audience, as we said, use peripheral cues. We've said this before. Um, there is a personality characteristic. You know... There are so many characteristics of you that psychologists have discovered how to measure, you know, like uh, introversion. And then they'll create a, some kind of a psychological scale and they'll measure questions and then they'll give you a score. And even intelligence is really one of these things, right? One of these hypothetical constructs. And they're going to measure, they're going to ask some questions and assign a score to you. And then everybody gets a score. And Well, one of those measures, those psychological characteristics that um, some psychologists have created is something called need for cognition. And again, it's just like intelligence or, or, or introversion or, or um, uh, adventurousness or something like this. Uh, religiosity is one that I do some research on. And... Uh, in, in the same way, you can quantify it in some way by asking a bunch of questions. But what this thing is, is this psychological characteristic is a motivation to think and analyze. Some people are more likely to, um, let's say, need for cognition. Some people in their free time would, uh, would prefer to watch um, Jersey Shore. Some people in their free time would prefer to watch um, How the Earth Was Formed, okay? And, I mean, I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm just saying one one probably indicates a higher need for cognition. People that are high in need for cognition are far more likely to, um, to uh, be influenced by the central route of persuasion. Here, like say, for example, here's two questions on the need for cognition scale. There's even a scale for it. Thinking is not my idea of fun. From strongly disagree to strongly agree. <laughs> so, um, if you put strongly agree, chances are you are fairly low in need for cognition. I like tasks that require little thought once I've learned them. And if you strongly agree, then you are probably low in need for cognition. Okay, that's probably a true statement. Uh, it's just pretty similar. Um, all right, cults. 
so how does a cult indoctrinate? Well, first off, what is a cult? A cult is a group typically characterized by distinctive ritual and beliefs related to the devotion of a god or a person. It involves isolation from an, uh, an evil culture. I'm, I'll take a look. A cult is a group. Okay. Here's what happens. Is in a cult, how do they do it? Okay. In fact, you know what? I don't want to talk too much about it here. I'm just going to zip a zip a zip -a, And then I will talk about it in the little video for that paper. Okay? So that will encourage you to actually watch the video for the chap, uh, the, the, the paper four, I think it was. Okay? So they use different techniques that we have seen before to become more persuasive. Okay? We're going to talk about it. And then they, and then they, and then they... So, stopping and going back, so now, like I said, you want to know about cults? Watch the other video. Now here, okay, strengthening personal commitment. I like this. How can persuasion be resisted? This is one of my favorite things that comes out of, um, my favorite things that come out of uh, uh, social psych. And in fact, I used this one not too long ago when I was doing a, a sermon for uh, my church. I was, for the Sunday school, I was writing a sermon. And um, I put together a little... Um, scenario so uh if you were to experience if you were to find this at your school what would be the appropriate way to behave okay and so what i did was i a series of um uh stories little scenarios you know uh, i can't remember the deal the details but they were like mary is you know she's going to the bathroom she has a hall pass and there's nobody around and she goes around the corner and there's twenty dollars on the floor and Nobody knows that Mary found that $20, and Mary could put it in her pocket, and Mary is so excited because she has never had that much money in, at her, you know, in her life, and it's such a big deal. Should Mary keep the money, you know, and, and the kids and, and this, oh, no, you know. So by going through this, this is called attitude inoculation. So if you go through this with them ahead of time, they're more likely to perhaps um, follow the correct behavior when they actually get into a scenario. Okay, what you do is before you uh, actually reach that situation, you make a commitment or something. Um, you expose people to a weak attack upon their attitudes, so that when stronger attacks come, they will have refutations available. I like this here. Um, they did one 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 research study where they uh, they took these kids and um, they gave them attitude inoculations towards smoking they had them take a little a seminar course or something and they gave the kids again scenarios you know and so judy's friend said you'd look so cool oh if you smoke and then and then um they'd have the kids role playing then the other kid would go i'd be a real chicken if i smoked just to impress you you know they had the kids kind of pull out these little Things is really kind of neat. If, if any of you remember um, going back, there was uh, the Virginia Slims company used to have the advertisements that that, sh that uh, tried to kind of portray some. Uh, it, Virginia Slims was a cigarette marketed exclusively to women, and they tried to portray this as a sophisticated woman who was all liberated. You know, this was from the women's lib movement. Burn my bra and smoke my Virginia Slims, and. Um, and so they showed, and, and by the way, the um, their market, their slogan, their slogan. Uh, there's always some glamorous looking woman and everything, but their slogan was, uh, "You've come a long way, baby." That was it. You've come a long way, baby. And so they showed like these kinds of images, and then they said to these, you know, had these kids look at them, and and then they taught them to say something like, "She's not really liberated if she's hooked on tobacco." That makes sense, right? How the hell do you have Lynn's lib if she's just sort of switched her? switch to you know from one to another okay and so we can see um on this graph on the left side they had this attitude inoculation group on the orange and this uh, control group in the green and by the time the kids were what is this ninth grade holy shit by ninth grade 15 to 20 percent of the kids were smoking in the control group but only about five percent were smoking in the uh what is that? M oh, months. I see. Uh, but only about 5% of the kids in the inoculation group. So it worked really quite good. I mean, it, it dropped smoking by 10% in these kids. Um, and here's one of my favorite um, advertisements. I miss my lung, Bob. 
There was that cowboy, the Marlboro man. I don't know how it's related to this slide, but I like the one, so I'll put it there. Um, well, it turns out that children are more persuadable than grown-ups are. They have less, um, well, by the way, they are more, um, more susceptible to the uh, su peripheral route of persuasion. They're more susceptible to the simple things such as jingos and um, attractiveness and cartoon characters are very attractive. Um, I remember when I uh, when I was in college, um, the uh, Camel Cigarette Company had as their mascot Joe Camel, and Joe Camel used to show up everywhere. He'd be on T-shirts, he'd be on hats, he'd be everywhere. I mean, Joe Camel was awesome. The cool thing was to have a, a, a Joe Camel T-shirt or something, and um, you could really only get those by mailing in the uh, the little wrappers. To get, I guess you could probably buy them, but I mean that's how I got mine, you know. <laughs> Don't know anybody, okay? Um, but then some parent groups were, were just screaming that the camel company was trying to. Um, oh, and, and they also had some other things. They, some people, they uh, hyper analyzed Joe Camel, and they said if you looked at the twirls and the drawing and stuff, that looked like a penis, and they were trying to hook your kids by penis noses. And <laughs> it's freaky, man. But uh, no, there was a huge screaming campaign by these parents groups that you were trying to market to children because Joe Camel was, um, you know, being being marketed to young children to get them in. Um, yeah, you know, they were. I'm sure they were. Okay, and so Joe Camel disappeared pretty soon because they decided they 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 were really criticized for it. Well, many European nations restrict advertising that targets children. They have. Um, uh, let's say, I, b I believe it was uh, on any television channel could only run X number of hours or, you know, a certain percentage or something like that. Um, here in America, however, the average child sees 10,000 commercials a year. Thankfully, this number has modified quite a bit because of the uh, DVRs and things like that. I mean, hell, I've dropped cable, and so any television my kids watch is Netflix, and so there's zero commercials. So I don't know if that makes a difference or not, but my kids stop asking me for crap they don't need, right? So maybe it works. In general, my children refuse to eat anything that hasn't danced on television. <laughs> I like that. That's Irma Bombay. She was a um, satirical comedian. I don't know what to call her. A satirist, I guess, from the, from the 70s. She was hilarious. But uh, anyway, I like this phrase. Um... It has been shown, in the, similar to the attitude inoculation study, it has been shown that children can be inoculated to television advertising by viewing and analyzing ads with grown-ups. Yeah, I do this. Sometimes um, my kids used to come to me with these, uh, especially, you know, these um, for sale on television things. They would have, like, the UFO hovercraft. Send 1995 to this address. And... Um, then my kids would come in, oh, God, look, Dad, it's only 1995. Oh, my God, Dad. And so then I'd have to start with them, and I'd have to break it down. I would say, no, look, okay, it's the three easy payments of 1995 plus shipping and handling. So now look at those numbers. It's not 1995, son. That turns into $70 right there, okay? Not only that, but I want you to look at that product, and I want you to imagine our house. Okay, you see that UFO hovercraft and you see the way that that kid is shooting it like that. If you shot that in our house, the first thing that's going to do is hit the ceiling and it's going to break as soon as it hits the ceiling. And if you take it outside and do it, I guarantee you that the, the third or fourth time you put it up in the air, it's going to go over the neighbor's fence and it's going into the it's going to go into the pool and the guy behind us and it's going to be garbage. Okay. That's what's going to happen to it. It's going to be $70, and it's not going to work like it shows on television, okay? I, in fact, um, talked to my children about a documentary I saw one time about how they um, how they produce uh, the commercials. And in particular, I talk about um, how they uh, photograph French fries for the McDonald's commercials. And so they make the French fries, and then they leave them sit for a week to get them nice and hard, and then they jam toothpicks up the middle of them so that they stand up really straight in the box, and then they, they glaze them to make them all shiny looking, and then they drop on some salt to stick to the glaze, okay, so it look, you can see the salt and the glaze and the glisten, and then they put dry ice in the bottom of the package to make the steam come up. And so now this wonderful package of french fries that they're showing you 
is nothing more than a week old with toothpicks up the middle, glazed with uh, the, the dry ice inside. Yummy? Not yummy. Take your pick. Okay, and so I talk about this with my kids, and and they're. I admit it makes them a little bit more pessimistic about the world, but um, maybe a little pessimism isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, Entering the message, comprehension of whatever. That's cute. We've seen it. Okay. Uh. Factors that in help or hinder information campaigns, blah, blah, blah. You go, blah. You read that stuff. All right, but what about propaganda? I like this. Propaganda is an act of persuasion that systematically spreads biased information and is designed to support or oppose a person, product, cause, or organization. Um, I uh, was lucky enough to visit the, the, the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, up between North and South Korea. And um, it's really kind of cute because... Both sides, both sides have um, 24 hours a day, they have um, ads, uh, 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 messages, messages being blasted out at the soldiers, okay? The South Koreans are sending out um, the message to the North Koreans saying, I can't believe that you're standing there every day when your family doesn't even get food or something like that. And then the message from the North comes in and says, uh, you're being lied to by the American puppets, all right? Um, it's crazy. Um, the propaganda is just, it just it's really funky, the stuff that comes out. Um, by the way, I just read about the South, uh, the North Koreans. It's freaking the living shit out of me. They said that that uh, it's so bad up there that the the kids in kindergarten, you know what they they're doing to these kids? They're brainwashing them so badly. Um, during kindergarten, a, a normal routine. This is a game, you know. When I was in kindergarten, we played kickball or tetherball or something like that. What they do is they, honest to God, they take these little kids, these four, five, six year olds, and they give them a gun with a bayonet on it, and their job is to ram it into an American soldier's stuffed dummy. They're five years old, and the the, the, the dummy is all, I mean, and, and they make it, it's crazy too, because they give it this huge hooked nose, a real, uh, a real portrayal of the Jew, a Jewish person is really what they're doing, and it's really, really, really offensive. Um, and taking it forward, they, they're um, they're teaching their children that it is their job to not to defend their country. No, believe it or not, it's not to defend their country. In fact, it is their job to um, pay back. It's payback time. It's revenge time. Okay, that is what they're teaching their children: is that the Americans have. Um, it is any problem that they have is the Americans' fault, and their job is not to defend their country, but their job is to. To, to to seek revenge upon the Americans that have, in fact, created their problems. Oh, my. Um, that's an interesting thing. They're being indoctrinated not to defend. They're indoctrinated for revenge. At five years old, they're given a gun with a bayonet, stab the soldier, and scream out how much you need to seek revenge on them. Oh my. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, propaganda a little bit. Um, you need to be aware of it. It's um, it is what it is. Okay, we're going to talk about in these next bunch of slides. We're going to just talk very briefly about different ways that you might um, instill propaganda. I mean, it might be used for persuasion too. I mean, remember, persuasion is a broad broad word that one side calls education and one calls propaganda. I'll call it propaganda on here, but to get you get the message, okay? Sam, a convicted felon, wants to ban smoking in restaurants. His opponents attack his criminal record, not his idea. Now the lawbreakers want to make the laws, okay? And it's like the fact that Sam, a convicted felon. The, the fact that Sam is a convicted felon is absolutely irrelevant to whether or not he wants to... Is banning smoking in restaurants a good idea, yes or no? Okay? That is a question which is separate from the fact that Sam is a convicted felon. That is just not related. That's a personal attack. Um, and it's used often in, in criminal courts. It's used, it's used often. Okay? Uh, a straw man fallacy in which a weak argument substitute for a stronger one to make... Uh, Argument easier to challenge here. Uh, Governor Goodfeeling opposes drilling for oil in Alaska. So now, 
It's complicated, I'm sure. Governor Goodfeeling has a lot of reasons for opposing oil drilling in Alaska. We don't know what they all are, but well, let's simplify the argument, right? But the U.S. is too dependent on foreign oil supplies, and the economy would benefit from having an American supply of oil. The governor wants to keep us dependent on foreign oil cartels. You never once addressed why Governor Goodfeeling opposes drilling. You didn't. You never asked. Instead, you threw out and changed it completely. You've changed the argument into a different argument. Begging the question restates the point of an argument as about circular reasoning. Spinach is awful tasting food because it tastes bad. I just had an argument about that with my kid this morning when he was trying to define, um, oh, what was, oh, shunned. He was trying to define the word shunned. I asked him to, to define it for some work we were doing. He says, shunned, um, to shun something. Uh, no, that's not how you define the word shunned, okay? Um, name calling, negative labels, all right? Throwing negative, uh, emotionally charged labels. Um, this is one, um, again, I want to avoid politics, but uh, whatever. Christina Singer has an air of raunchy diva in her newest album. Even though her voice delivers a decent mix of pop, rock, and soul, her vampire in leather costume and wicked witch makes up make her act scary to watch. Okay, And so we're throwing out these huge emotion-laden words, or even more in this last one. People who burn the flag are traitors. Traitors is a really, really heavily laden word, okay? Um, I'm not sure that that's quite the word, because, I mean, words have baggage, and sometimes if you pull out a word with a whole crap load of baggage, it does make the rest of the statement sound pretty convincing. But maybe that's not logic 101. Testimonials, irrelevant personal opinions to support a product. This is obviously celebrity spokesman. Famous athlete Jerome Highjumper says, Drinking milk every day makes me the athlete I am. Yeah, I think Jerome Highjumper will probably be selling something other than milk. Uh, the bandwagon uses or suggests the irrelevant detail that everyone is doing it, so you should too. Uh, this is, yeah, I like this one. I should be able to stay out until 3 a.m. All the other kids can. I'm the only one who isn't allowed to stay out late on prom night. If you've ever been a parent, this is the one I get all the time. Oh, my God. All the kids on the bus have a smartphone. They all have an iPhone. They all have blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to tell you the simple answer to the bandwagon argument. And is this? Yeah, but they're not my kids. I can't control what happens to those kids. In fact, this argument has come up so many times that I don't even have to say the whole, it's not my kids and blah, blah, blah. I just got to say, not my kids. That's it. My kid, my son knows exactly the whole story that goes with it. You know, I can't control what other parents do. And <laughs> it's awesome. Not my kids. That's all I say. Plain folks, on the other hand, we go we go the opposite of Jerome Highjumper, uses irrelevant details and tries to make something more um, everyday folk, everyday manageable. A candidate running for office, dressed in blue jeans and a plaid shirt, eating a hot dog. Or um, there was that presidential candidate, or the one that was trying to become a president, the, the Rick Santorum, who uh, was, was, was becoming famous for wearing the... Um, the, the sweater vests, okay? I'm so down to earth I wear a sweater vest, you know? Um, in fact, some of these uh, some of these candidates, they, they make it a point of pride to put out their income taxes and go, look, I mean, I'm just like you. I'm making 80 grand a year or something like that, okay? So try to make it uh, look like it's something that you could relate to. Either or, black or white fallacies, okay? If you don't give to the toy drive, you don't care about children. It ignores a ton of things. If you don't give to the toy drive, you're too busy. If you don't give to the toy drive, you don't have any money this year. If you don't give to the toy drive, you forgot. No, 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 no. There's only one solution. If you don't give to the toy drive, you don't care. All right, that's just bad stuff. Uh, a false analogy comparing two things. Animals deserve the same rights as humans. And um, it's just taking two things that are do not belong to the same class and just lumping them together as though they do belong to the same class. Uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. This is one of my favorites. Um, uh, it, it, and 
it's a persuasive well how is it in persuasion it's one of my favorites I learned it in logic class I, I learned this in uh, one of the very few Latin phrases I can remember post hoc or go propter hoc after that therefore because of that and that is this um, mistaken assumption that just because A follows B means that uh, A caused B all right or wait B comes after A. just because B comes after A means that A caused B A was the cause of B and I don't know that doesn't feel like a a decent argument but Whatever. Going on. Card stacking omits factual details in order to represent a product or idea. I like this. A commercial mentions that the product is low in fat, but fails to say that it's loaded with sugar and calories. Yeah, you know, the only reason I buy the um, the uh, good and plenty. Oh, I love good and plenty. Dude, don't mess with my good and plenty. They're low in fat. Check it out. It says so right on the box. A low-fat candy. Uh, yeah, again, uh, transfer causes uh, creates an association between a product idea or a cause with a symbol or image that has a positive or negative value. It's like somebody puts God plus America on a product. Um, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm a little troubled by this because, you know, I, I fall victim to it. I'll admit it. I'm looking in the phone book. Let's, let's say I need a plumber. And so I look in the phone book and next to this one plumber, there's a Jesus fish. I'm much more likely to, to hire the plumber that put a Jesus fish next to its name. And it's not because it's um, transferring or creating an association with God, but it's putting, giving, uh, it's making me believe that if the person put a Jesus fish next to her name, then they belong to the category of Christian. And therefore, um, again, this is stereotypes. Remember my two images. I might have honesty. Christians, not Christians, or something, and in my mind, those members of the category Christian are are higher on the honesty scale than those members of not labeled that. I mean, I'm, that's my stereotype. That is clearly my stereotype. But this is this is what's going on when I when I get this type of a that persuasive thing. Glitterating generalities. Uh, general positive statements, uh, sort of like, uh, very similar to that other negative one, which was trying to persuade you against something by just throwing out these emotionally charged words. It's the same kind of a thing. A vote for a candidate, Anthony Vaccaro, is a vote for honesty and integrity. It's like, how much emotion, yet what does it really mean to jump, to throw those words, honesty and integrity? They sound so good. They suggest such positive things, but... Do you have anything to back it up? Is Ant I mean, why, if I vote for Anthony Vaccaro, am I voting for honesty? What, what, what is that even getting at? Here's some interesting videos that uh, if you were sitting in my classroom, I would have showed you because they were very interesting. Um, this, the tricks that advertisers use on you, uh, how, how a uh, company will establish your credibility in your mind. Uh, and again, how a website would establish itself as credible. Um, nowadays, with, with so many websites out there, how can you make yours stand out as, as, as the one that you can trust? But finally, there was this uh, article. I can, I, I, it's been a long time since I read it, but I, uh, you read it. It is really interesting, okay? It is so, and it's real quick and it's real short. But uh, suffice it to say... Um, there are some real interesting tricks that they do in the supermarkets. Before I do, actually, it reminds me of a really, really funny um, research study. It's totally unrelated to this, but when I think about supermarkets, I think about it. They, uh, they had a bag of Doritos, and they put it in the shopping cart, and then they had people rate, you know, how desirable is this bag of Doritos on a scale of 1 to 10? And people are like, oh, man, that's like a nine. Oh, my God, I love Doritos, you know. And then they put it in the shopping cart. And then in the same shopping cart, but on the opposite side of it, they put um, a box of tampons. How desirable is the Doritos? Oh, seven. They're good. I love them. People were not aware that the tampons being present in the uh, shopping cart affected them. Then uh, they did a third group where they put the... the the bag of Doritos in the shopping cart and the box of tampons in the shopping cart actually touching the bag of Doritos. And they're like, how desirable is the Doritos? And being like, oh, I love Doritos, but somehow I'm just not in the mood today. I give it a four. <laughs> I don't know how it's related, but it's such an awesome study. Um, all right. So anyway, how supermarkets turn shoppers into hoarders. Um, I'm going to remember some of the things in here. Number one, they... Um, 
they they gave it an air of upscaleness. You know, they gave it a uh, they they in, uh, they invested some money into the flooring. Instead of putting the cheap linoleum on the floor, they had nice parquet flooring, which did a couple of different things. In fact, they put in nice parquet flooring, which was uh, higher quality, so that it made you think that. Um, and by the way, this is really interesting article. You've got to read it. So that it made a, a loud noise when you went over it so that people would slow down. So you slowed them down so they're not walking so fast past your products. They're slowing through the products. It, um, it, it gave, it raised the quality of every product around it, okay? It raised the opinion of every single product. Then uh, they did a couple of other tricks like they made some scarcity. They said, um, you know, they, they, uh, they, well, like, they had limit three or something like that. And when there was a limit three, and they did all these different tricks. You should read this because there were so many different simple tricks. If, if you know, the product was 99 cents, the average person bought, you know, 0.1 of them or something. But if there was a 99 cents limit three, the average person bought like two of them or something. It was like they quintupled the price just by saying limit three, just by making it look as though it was a scarce product. Um... I don't know. It seems a little crazy to me, right? Uh, but it worked. And there's a variety of other tricks that they used here. And they're very scientific, by the way. Very, very scientific. And these tricks that they used to literally not just change, you know, again, the goal was not to persuade you or to change your opinion. The goal was to make you buy more of this product, okay? And so I believe their their product of interest was Campbell's Soup, but I, it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. So anyway, if you want to know something more about um, running a cult, maybe you ought to check out that short video about Paper 4, all right? I'll see you in a bit.